Good morning, CBC family and friends, and welcome back to our online service here on YouTube. So glad to see all of you back here after a long week to receive His Word together. You know, we had a wonderful time celebrating Good Friday as one CBC family on Friday evening as we reflected and meditated upon God's love for us and what Jesus has done on the cross for us. And this morning, we will be celebrating Easter Sunday together as we look at not only the empty tomb, but the life that He now offers to all of us. So if this is your first time joining us or if you are new here, we would love to connect with you. Our CBC English churches are found in many different locations such as SS2, Subang, Kota Damansara, Puchong and even Kota Kumuning. So do get in touch with one of our leaders or give us a call so that we can help connect you with one of our communities right away. So right before we worship the Lord together, let us declare the most famous and recognized Bible verse in the whole world, John 3.16. We'll be reading this together from the NIV version. So together in one voice, let's read. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank You for loving us unconditionally. Thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for your patience, and for your everlasting faithfulness to your children. This morning, we are eternally grateful at not only what you have done for us on the cross, but also for what you are still doing today in our lives. And we want to praise and honor you mightily this morning, for you are deserving of all glory, honor, and praise. Indeed, Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things and in Him all things hold together. So Father, we give you full permission this morning to minister to our hearts and let the praise of your people be a sweet sound and a pleasing aroma to your ears. In Jesus' most powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come, let us worship the risen King, our Lord Jesus Christ, together this morning.
shelter I was an orphan But you would call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken
Stars they went, the morning sun was dead. The savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse upon. Yeah. 
Amen. Thank you, worship team, for the powerful time of worship. Let us continue in worship by bringing our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us this opportunity to be able to worship you and hear your word, even though we are gathered in different places but still connected with you here. We bring our tithes and offerings before you as part of our worship this morning, and we thank you for your love, for your sacrifice, for your provision, and your blessings to us. And we pray that the resources that we give will be a channel of blessing that you can use to build your church and advance your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. So we pray. Praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, we just want to highlight a few announcements. Firstly, our CBC Young Working Adult platform is organizing a special event for all the young working adults in CBC. We will be having both a picnic as well as a game of frisbee together at Wetlands Putrajaya next Sunday on the 24th of April at 4.30pm. Some of the list of things to bring are a bottle of water, a towel, as well as a change of clothes. And the registration deadline is by next Thursday on the 21st of April. So if you are a young working adult and you want to be part of this special event, remember to let your young adult leaders or church leaders know. Looking forward to see all of you there. Secondly, we will be having our AGM right after church at 2pm today. So for all CBC registered members who have registered for the AGM, kindly be present by 2pm sharp so that we can begin on time. See all of you later. Thirdly, we are organizing a CBC Churchwide Water Baptism next Sunday as well on the 24th of April at 2pm in the premises of our CBC Sea Park Fellowship Hall. So if you would like to be baptized, kindly register with us by today through the Google Form link that we are sending out through the WhatsApp groups. Pastor Gordon himself will contact you directly after you register and you are required to go through a water baptism class next Saturday on the 23rd of April from 10am to 12pm before the baptism day itself. Fourthly, in regards to our CBC English Morning Devotion series, we will be taking a two-week break starting from tomorrow, 18th of April until 29th of April and we will resume on the 2nd of May with a new series on the book of Exodus. And that is all for our announcements today. So this morning, we are delighted to welcome Elder Dr. Ong Si Lian to share the Word of God with us. So without any further delay, let us all put our hands together and welcome to the stage Elder Dr. Ong Si Lian. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Great to see you on this Sunday and Easter morning. Now we have been remembering the Lord's death over the past week. How often it is important for us today to rejoice on the very fact that Jesus is alive. And I want you to, wherever you are, know this one fact, that we worship a God that is alive, a God that is real, a God that is true to each one of us. So today I'm going to get into the book of Hebrews and discover for each one of us what a great salvation that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. When we were growing up, or when I was growing up at least as a child, we like to attend movies which shows the superheroes. Now we have the Superman at that time, the Batman, you know, Captain America, and all sorts of old. And their main role that we admire most is that they come at the most critical time to save the people from danger or from the villains. I also like a lot of Kung Fu film. And uh, when you go to the movies, you know, the Chinese Kung Fu, they have the villains and they have the heroes. The one upside man, you know, the one who come and ultimately save the people from the danger or from the villains. Notice what the world's looking for even today. In the midst of its problems, people are looking to politicians, they're looking to governments for a solution to their problem. And the contentions, the wars that we find, people are trying to find a solution to their problem. But can they ever find the true saviour? Today I'm going to ask you this question. You know, men throughout the ages have been struggling to know God, to find that redemption from the problems or from the sin and from the problems of the world. 
and they try to soak off reaching out to God. And they try all sorts of religion, they use religion. And uh, that's why we have so many religions, you know, each one of them telling their own way of how they can reach God or how they can find a solution to the problems and, and the sorrows of mankind. They also try to do good works, meaning that good works will bring good karma to them and that will help them to elevate themselves to the next life. And many therefore thought that through good works, they can bring redemption to themselves as well as to help others. I'm not saying that it's not good to have good work. In fact, I find a lot of non-Christians who are doing excellent good works. But I want to tell you today that good works alone cannot save us. And people who will try all sorts of rituals, if I may say even some so-called Christians who are doing some rituals, they come to church, they observe the Good Friday, even Easter, thinking that by observance of these religious rituals, they can bring them salvation. But is that something on trying on our heart, on our part to reach out to God? But you know, the Bible tells us that all the human efforts are a failure. It can never bring redemption for ourselves or bring solution to the problems that we face in this world. Our only way is to accept, to receive God as He reaches out to us. God who condescends to become a man through His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. He came into this world to bear our sin. He went to the cross to die for us on the cross. And because of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, it was accepted by God to be the redemption for our sins. You know, Easter we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what the story of the Bible is all about. That Jesus did not only die for us, but He rose again on the third day. He rose to prove that He has now power over sin and over death, over the devil. And that's why He brings us deliverance. And so today we have the risen God, the risen Lord Jesus, who is with us today. And this is the message I want to bring to you in the course of today. The Bible will show us that salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ is indeed a great salvation. It's not just a concept, it's not a theory, it's not even a legion. It is the reality of what salvation is all about. And what is most amazing is that this salvation in our Lord Jesus Christ is greater than any other salvation than the superheroes that you know. Any salvation that you can imagine or made up as you see in the movies is greater than the salvation that ever man can made out of. And the best part of this is it is real. It is true because you can experience it, you can partake of it. And this is what the good news I'm going to bring to you about. And let's read what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2 about this great salvation we have in Jesus. Verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 2 says, We must pay the most careful attention. And therefore, to what you have heard, do not drift away. For since the message spoken to the angels were binding, and every violation and disobedience received is it's just a, a punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? And this salvation which was first announced by the Lord was confirmed to us by those who heard them. And God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed by God according to His will. It is not to angels that He has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, a son of man that you care for him. And you made them a little lower than the angel. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. 
putting everything under them. God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at the present, we do not see everything subject to them, but we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, and but now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for every one of us. In bringing so many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom, through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one he makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. And he says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children of God has given me. Verse 14, Since then the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely this is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become the merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. And verse 18 says, Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is also able to help those who are being tempted. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, our Heavenly Father, what a day it is today we can celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we are reminded from the scripture, even as we have read them just now, Lord, that you were very God himself, and yet you condescended to bear the humanity, to be like us, so that, Lord, ultimately you can bear our sin and to die for us on the cross. And Lord, today, even as we come and examine your word once again, reassure into our hearts that, Lord, you came to redeem and to save those who are lost. We confess we were lost and we need you to be our saviour. And we therefore, Lord, ask you to open our hearts and our minds this morning to receive you as who you are, the very God himself who came to be our saviour of the world. So bless each one of us as we listen to your word, O oh God. For this we ask in the most powerful name of our dear Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this morning I want to bring to you three important points about this great salvation that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. Firstly, the importance of knowing the truth. And secondly, to know that there is a hope for now and the future. And thirdly, to know that Jesus is our only Saviour. You know, in the first verse of Hebrews chapter 2, it says that we must pay the most careful attention, and therefore, to what we have heard, and so that we do not drift away. You know, the question now is, are we paying attention? Are we paying attention to the Word of God, what God wants to speak to us? You know, often our minds and our hearts, we think of so many issues and problems in our, in our midst. You know, we must not give half our minds or half our ears, we must give the most careful attention to what we are here concerning the Gospel, the truth that we need to know about our life and our future, so that we will not drift away. Notice the scripture used the word drift away. It means slowly, little by little, it will undermine our confidence and the foundation of our life and our faith. If we do not dig into God's truth, God's word, and receive them day by day, and we succumb ourselves to the cares of this world, the worries and the influences of this world, what would they do? 
it would help, it would cause us to drift away. It would take us further and further off course from what God intended for us. You know, many of us know what a sinkhole is like. You know, suddenly when you go through during heavy rain, you know, you find a big hole in the middle of the road or at the back of your house, you know, just recently one of my neighbors at the back of the house, a sinkhole happened because one of the drainage pipes have broken and because of the broken pipe, the water has seeped into the soil and undermined the foundation. The water has drifted away the foundation, the soil, little by little. And over the years, without realizing, one day suddenly wake up, you find there's a huge hole. And fortunately, if your house is founded on a good pile of foundation, it will not collapse. If not, just like this wall, as you see, you know, when there is an undermining of the foundation, the drifting away of the, that foundation, the soil that is behind the wall, you find that the disaster that will, will cause. And that is what sinkholes often appear. You know, sometimes it's because of the geotechnical conditions of the soil, and when there's water seepage, it will dissolve some of the limestone below it and slowly it will create bigger holes and the soil on top of it will just fall through causing a sinkhole. And that's what it means to be drifting away. Without us sometimes realizing it, we allow the cares of this world to undermine the foundation and without us first realizing it, suddenly we collapse and the whole world between us collapse. And that's why many people are falling into the condition because they have not built their lives on the foundation. And they allow the cares of the world to, to undermine and to cause them to get into the state of depression or even giving up hope and giving up on their life. As we see, there are many ideas of salvation, but the gospel of our Lord Jesus is distinct as we see in the scripture. Our natural inclination is to drift away from the truth of God because our hearts are naturally sinful. That's why the Bible in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? It is the nature of our heart. And the Gospel of Mark reiterates this point. He says, For it is from within. Out of the person's heart that evil thoughts come, such as sexual immorality, thefts, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. And all these evils come from inside and it defiles a person. Friends, brothers and sisters, we must accept the fact that we are all sinners before God. There's nothing can help us to redeem of our sinful nature except the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's why we need to know the gospel truth. We need to know what God himself tells us about salvation. And so in Hebrews chapter 1, he says that the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. The Son meaning Jesus. He sustained all things by His powerful word. And after He had provided purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. This one verse alone summarizes the entire being of our, our Lord Jesus Christ and His work for the sin of, of the humankind. Firstly, Jesus is truly divine. He's the radiance of God's glory and the exact repre representation of God's being, and He is God Himself. He's divine. Yes, He's divine. He's also human. He, God become man. That's what Jesus is. And secondly, He provided purification for our sins. What does it mean? He died for our sins. And so that by the blood of Jesus on the cross, his blood was able to wash away our sins. His blood was accepted by God as the perfect sacrifice, which is acceptable by God. 
His blood was the perfect atonement for our sin. And that's what it means. And what is wonderful to know that on the, the third point from this verse is that he is now seated at the right hand of God. Not only he died, which is necessary to pay for our sin, but he resurrected from his death. And now he ascended into heaven and he will return again to receive us. The authors of Hebrews also give us another warning. In verses 2 and 3, it says, Since this message is spoken through angels was binding, every violation and disobedience receive its punishment. How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? And this salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who have heard Him. No, the Bible is very clear that every violation or disobedience of God will receive its just judgment, punishment. And the punishment are deserved because they are actually in violation of God's law. They're in total rebellion of God. Because of this violation of the law represents a violation against the righteous demands of God, who is holy and who is righteous. But we thank God that we need not have to go through that punishment because Jesus has come and He has become the scapegoat. He has taken upon Himself our sin and paid for the penalty on our behalf. You know, we as natural sinners, we cannot keep the laws. Whatever effort we try to be good, we cannot even keep the laws we make up sometimes for ourselves. You know, you can talk about this sometimes, you know, even the politicians talk about they make laws, but only one set of laws for the people, one set, another set of laws for themselves. You know, recently the Prime Minister of United Kingdom got into trouble. Well, he enforces strict, uh, you know, SOP for people during the COVID, but he himself having a party in his own office. You know, that's what human beings are. We make laws but we can't even keep the laws that we make for ourselves because we are natural born law breakers. And we have to accept that. That's why Romans chapter 3, 23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And he says, The wages of sin is death, or the penalty of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, how can we accept, we escape the God's punishment? And that's why we need this great salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. In verses 3 to 4 says, How shall we escape if we ignore a great salvation? And this salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard Him, and God has testified to it by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. How do we know salvation is defined by the only true salvation? Firstly, because God Himself has announced it. And secondly, there are eyewitnesses of this great salvation. People have seen how Jesus was crucified on the cross. And these are real historical evidence. And thirdly, God confirmed it by the gift of the Holy Spirit. Even now, each and every one of us who receive Jesus into their life can have the Holy Spirit indwelling, affirming. It's like God says in another part of the Bible, says that it's the seal or guarantee of your salvation by the gift of the Holy Spirit. Firstly, God Himself announced it. Not the gospel announced directly by God. The Lord Jesus Himself announced it Himself to be the Savior. Hebrews 1 tells in the last day, God has spoken to us by His Son. God in various ages spoken by His prophets and uh, through creation. But in the last days, He sent His Son, Jesus, to speak to us about this great salvation. In Matthew 7, Jesus Himself, Matthew 4 verse 17 says, Jesus Himself said, Repent, for the kingdom of, of heaven has come near. Now, if you read from the Bible, right from the beginning of the creation of man in the Garden of, 
of, of Eden, God continues to announce His great salvation plan for humanity. And throughout the ages, through the prophets, through the nation of Israel, God announced the coming of the Messiah. And ultimately, in the gospel, we find Jesus has come into this world to be the Savior of the world. God announced it. He declares it to us. And I believe God continues to tell us by the Holy Spirit, whispering to your heart, even right now, wherever you are, that He has come to redeem and to save those who are lost. Secondly, there are eyewitnesses. There are real historical evidence of this great salvation. The author of Hebrew tells us that this message of salvation was confirmed by those who heard him. The early apostles, 12 of them, they were with Jesus. They were witnesses. That's why they are able to record in the Bible, in the Gospels, and in the letters that Paul wrote. There were some 500 disciples of Jesus who saw Jesus after he had risen from the dead. These are real people who testify. And later when Apostle Paul, who was one trying to crucify, uh, who wants to persecute the, the, the Christian church, he himself was confronted with the risen Christ. And from the name Saul, he was chained to Paul, became one of the greatest apostles for the gospel. From verse 4, we see that God himself confirmed their testimony and a double confirmation by signs and wonders and various miracles. And God continues to affirm the truth of the gospel by signs and wonders and various miracles. You know, throughout the ages, there are people who try to disprove the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I read that there was a one American lawyer by the name of Louis Wallace in the 19th century. He tried to disprove the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, what he did was he went through all the evidences and he tried to write a book disproving the resurrection of Jesus. But ultimately, Wallace himself, being a lawyer, he found that the evidence all point to the very fact that Jesus is truly resurrected from the dead. And that's why he wrote the famous book, Ben-Hur. Some of us who are older, you've probably seen the show, Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ. And in more recent time, there was another lawyer who tried to disprove, the, based on evidence, the resurrection of Jesus. Now, he was a skeptic. And then through all the searching and being honest to himself, when he discovered all the evidence, he found it all point to the fact, concrete evidence that Jesus is truly alive. He looked at the people who, the witnesses, the statements. He looked at how their life was transformed and changed. And he looked at the evidence of the, the, you know, the sustenance of the church of God throughout the century, despite its shortcoming, how people continue to, and he had come to this conclusion that Indeed, Jesus is alive. Jesus is resurrected. It's like Frank Morrison, he wrote the book, Who Moved the Stone? And we will continue to see that, brothers and sisters, friends. There are evidence of people's lives who have been transformed. Miracles happen every day. And all you need to do is to open your eyes to see around the miracles and the wonders, the signs that God is performing in the lives of the people around you throughout the world. Even in this pandemic situation, even in the midst of wars and rumors of war, God continued to work in our life. He's alive and He's available in each and every sphere of our life. And all you need to do is open up your eyes and open up your hearts to see God, the reality of that God that is alive among you. And the third evidence is God confirmed it by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. God gave us a great salvation by the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, on the day of Pentecost, in the book of Acts, we see the apostles spoke in different kinds of tongues, different languages which they did not study or they know. But they were declaring the glory of God and the foreigners that came into the city of Jerusalem, they heard it. They said, hi, they're speaking my language. 
How can they do that? It's the enablement of the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter and John healed the paralytic. And after the Pentecost, they were going about and great signs and wonders were performed by the apostles. They healed the sick. They raised even the uh, people from the dead. And God continued to open hearts. Paul and Silas, when they were going to the mission field in Philippi, the prison doors were open when they pray and, and sing praises to God. Now the living God, by the Holy Spirit Himself, continue to work through the church, through the body of Christ. And that's why so many of you see your friends in church today, they are testaments of the outworking of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And this is the great salvation we have in our Lord Jesus. So you need to know the truth. And there's so many evidence, the truth that is available for us. Just open up your ears, open up your eyes, just to know it and receive it. The second point I want to make this morning is that we have a hope for the future. You know, in verses 5 to 6, it says, It's not angels that he has subjected to the world to come, but for which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified, What is man? That you are mindful of them, that the son of man, that you care for him. The Bible is clear about the future. There will be a world to come. There is a new heaven and a new earth. The Hebrews author quotes from Psalm chapter 8 to show us that we are safe, not the angels. At the same time, we will have dominion in the world to come. Ephesians, the Bible tells us from the book of Ephesians that we become joint heirs with Christ when we come to know Him. And that is a wonderful thing. And we will be crowned with glory. We will either be resurrected or changed when He comes again. And we'll be transformed into the same condition as our Lord Jesus Christ. On that wonderful day, we will be like Him. That's why the Apostle John writes in 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 to 3, he said, Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. And all who have this hope in Him purify themselves as just He is pure. What a wonderful place to be when we see Jesus on that day. We will be crowned with honour. Our ranking will be indeed elevated to be like children of God. That's why in this passage, Jesus says, I can call them my brother, my sister. We are part of this family. Now, what a wonderful position to be in. And these promises that God has made for us is true. It's going to come into being. Look at what verse 9 says. It says, We do not see Jesus who has made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and all because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. We can know these promises are true when we look at Jesus. In many ways, Jesus has partaken of the life that we live. He has taken our suffering, our sorrow, even sometimes the weakness of the flesh. He has gone through all the temptations that we face, the frustration sometimes, the agony, the persecution. You know, you talk about all this. Jesus has borne all this. He even bore the worst of the persecution that is ultimately to die the most cruel death on the cross. And how much more, he says, that we can also partake in the life that he lives. The book of Galatians, Paul wrote to the Galatians and said, I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. Not by myself or myself, but I live by faith in Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me. What a beautiful 
position for us, brothers and sisters. God himself has spoken to us and he has also given us that hope for the future. And my final point this morning is that Jesus is our only Savior. You know, we have many religions in the world who say, you know, they can do this and do this, but they can never assure us our salvation in, of the day. But it's only through Jesus have given us that assurance that we will also be redeemed, but also will place us in a position to be like Him. You know, in the rest of Hebrews, Chapter, 12, chapter 2, verses uh, 9 onwards, we see that there is a sharing going on of the life, the beautiful, the abundant life that God wants to share with us. And we can also share with what we have in Him. Not that He needs anything that, from us, but He comes to unite us, to, to be with us. God, Emmanuel, He is the God that is with us. And we can lean upon Him. We can trust Him every day. We cannot be living this life, walking by ourselves, try with our own efforts. We can trust in Him by the Holy Spirit, affirming the presence of God, the power of God in our lives. In verse 9 says, We do see Jesus who was made lower than the angels for a little while, but now crowned with glory and honor because He suffered death. It is impossible for us to save ourselves. But by His grace, Jesus came to save us. He did that by dying for us. That's why we are saved. Jesus tastes death for every one of us. Jesus, who is immortal, creator God, took on the human body so that He could die. Not just physically, but He tasted death eternally. No angel can take on this wrath. Only Jesus, the Son of God. He experienced eternal death. That's what Good Friday is all about for us. So that we have, do not have to go through that ourselves. That's why it, that's our great escape. Jesus, the Savior of the world, and is the great salvation. Verse 10 says, In bringing so many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom, through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he has suffered. Now, Jesus could not be our Savior if he did not suffer. Jesus was sinless, perfect in every way before he came into this world. And yet he took on the human nature. He went to the cross and suffered and died for us. Thank God that He's now risen and He's now perfect as it, it, he, he was in, as our Savior. And through the atoning death of Jesus Christ, God can forgive our sins at the same time maintain His perfect justice, His holiness and His judgment. And that is the nature, the grace of God that has been endowed to you and I as we celebrate Easter. In verse 11, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Now we were once sinners, we were ex-convicts, but by the grace of God, Jesus is not ashamed to call you and me brothers and sisters. Wow, what a wonderful privileged position we are in today. He calls us brothers and sisters, the Son of God. And Ephesians said we are being made joint heirs with Christ. What a wonderful picture it is to know that we can inherit the blessings and the goodness of God as His children. Now, you have never known Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Today, I want to invite you because there's never been a greater privilege than to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior because He calls us brothers and sisters. And when we give our life, we can enjoy the blessings of God that He has prepared. Now, the author of Hebrews proves this fact to us by quoting three New Testament scriptures. Firstly, he quotes, and Jesus is talking to us as if from the scripture in verse 12, 
He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing praises. And Jesus is quoting from Psalm 22, verse 22. Jesus openly declares the name of God to all of us. And he declares us to God as brothers and sisters. What a wonderful picture it is. You know, God is one and he exists. And Jesus is, is one in the Godhead. And he's in our assembly. Prophet Isaiah says that he will come as God with us. His name shall be called Emmanuel. God with us. And verse 13 is taken from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 17 and 18. Jesus said, I will put my trust in him. And this verse shows that he's just like us and he's an example for us to put our trust, our life in the hands of God. And that's what we all need to do, brothers and sisters. You want to become like children of God. You know, just imagine my three sons, you know, he wants to be my son and yet not willing to accept me as their father. No, that cannot be. And so as children, we must know who our father is. The reference is that here I am, the children of God has given me, and this is a picture. We are all together as a family of God. God, Jesus presents himself and us to God. And he literally brings us to the level that he is in glory. And Jesus partook of our humanity so that we can partake in His glory. And He also partook in our humanity to destroy and to defeat our greatest enemy. And that is sin, death, and the devil. The same in verses 14 to 15 says, and I like this verse, because since the children have flesh and blood, He too shed in their humanity so that by His death, He might break the power of Him who holds power of death and that is the devil. And free us who lives, whose lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. Today we know that many people are in that kind of bondage, in slavery, by fear, gripped by fear, not knowing the future. The fear of judgment because of the sins that they have committed, the wrongs they have committed. And they sometimes do not know how to get around with it. And that's how this world it is today. And they try to cover up. They try to cover their guilt. But it will surface again because you can never cover your guilt. It will surface. And Satan will take hold of this opportunity to condemn you and to enslave you. But verses 14, Jesus came to come and to break the curse, to break the power. In your life. So in his death, he declawed the hands of the devil. And you like the picture, he took a big file, he fell off the teeth of the, of, of the devil so that he would not have an opportunity to bite you. He will come with a chain and will chain him down. And he broke the power of the devil and rendered him powerless and deprived him of his influence in your life. And that's what you will become when you accept Jesus to be your saviour, not only He will free you from your sin, but He will free you from the damnation, from the influence, from the control of the devil in your lives. Now, would you accept Jesus to be your saviour today? Because there's such a privilege to, for deliverance, to be powerful in such a way to overcome sin and death and the devil. You know, devil can never harm the saints. If you are a child of God, you can go confidently. You can face all sorts of challenges in life, and yet you know God is for you and not against you. He, the Satan cannot accuse you. He cannot slander them. Yes, like Job, God may allow Satan to tempt him, and to, but yet he cannot take his life because God will not permit it. He can try. Satan can try and entice them, tempt them to sin. But they can no longer be bound and to give the saints over to the fear of death. Because Jesus has victory over death when he rose again from the dead. Death no longer has a source of fear and becomes indeed the entryway into eternal life 
and eternal blessings in God's presence, in God's kingdom. That's why Paul writes to Philip, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And that is a wonderful position to be in. And this is part of so great a salvation. Not only we are spared from the righteous judgment, the, condemna- the damnation of God, but we are saved from death. We are saved from the devil. We are saved from fear. We are saved from the power of the, of the devil. And we are now partakers of his victory over sin and death. And that is a position we all want to be. That's what position I want to be on this Easter Sunday morning. I want to remind myself I'm the victor in Christ Jesus. I can look at death. I can look at devil right in his face. I say, you have no hand upon my life because I have my Lord, my Savior, Jesus Christ, who is with me. And this salvation that we receive is not just for this time, in the future, when we die, but its salvation begins now. And I want you to know that you can have this salvation, you can have this glory right now when you come and accept Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Verses 16 to 17 say, Surely it's not angels he held, but Abraham's descendants, that's you and I. For this reason he had made like them fully human in every way, in order that he might become merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. And Jesus is our high priest. What is the high priest doing? To be an intercessor between man and God. And he stands before the throne of God to be our high priest, presenting our guilt to God. When, when God looked upon the blood of Jesus, God overlooked our sin and he received us as we are because the righteousness of Christ, the blood of Christ has already been imputed upon us. So salvation comes to mankind and this is because of God's grace. Jesus took on the nature of man, not of angel. He told the nature of the descendants of Abraham fully, man in every way, that he might become that perfect sacrifice for our sin. So ultimately, why did Jesus come? He came to save us. You know, the high priests on the earth, human, they have to, yes, they have to do atonement for the sins of the people, but they have to do repeatedly because they are not perfect. Every year they could do it, but Jesus' death, his role as a high priest, he did it once and for all for you and me because he was a perfect one. He was sinless. He was a perfect lamb of God that was sacrificed for us. But the lamb and the sacrifice that the, the, the human priests bring, they have to do that every year. The bulls and the lambs, every year they have to bring. But God accepted when he see his son, the Lamb of God who has borne for himself the sin of the world. Jesus offered himself, he gave up his life by the shedding of the blood on the cross and God accepted him as a payment for our sin. And he's now the high priest. He's our advocate. He stands between us and God. Jesus shed for our blood. You know why? He loves us. God loved the world, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, Jesus, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And that's a favorite verse we quote from John 3.16. In conclusion, there is only one salvation that is true. There is only one Savior that is able to redeem us and to save us from the damnation of sin to free us from the slavery of the devil and Jesus himself. And this is not an ordinary this is a salvation, it's an extraordinary, it's a great salvation. It's a salvation into eternal life, eternal glory, eternal honor. It's a salvation over death, over the devil, it's a salvation from the wrath of God. That's why it's such a great salvation, because we have such a great Savior who Himself is very God Himself. He came from heaven, made a little lower than the angels for a little while, but now crowned with glory and honor because He has suffered the death that we ought to suffer 
for our sins, so that by His grace He might taste death for you and me. That's what Easter is all about, brothers and sisters, my friends. When you put your trust in Him today, not only would you just be saved, but you have a great salvation. You have a great future ahead of you. There is salvation that is offered by our Lord Jesus Christ that we can never ignore. We can never take it for granted. And I trust that you will not reject it today if you have never known Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And so that you will not drift away. As I say, if you drift away little by little, the foundation of your life will one day collapse without you realizing it. Jesus himself proclaimed, I have come to seek and to save those who are lost. The apostles, the disciples, continue to pass it on from generation to generation, this good news. And those of us who are saved, we will continue to pass the message on. And God has mandated us. God has given that commission for us to go and preach the gospel and to baptize them and to teach them to observe all things that Christ have shown us. Would you receive this great salvation for those of us who do not know Jesus? For those of us who know Jesus, would you be passing on this message of the great salvation we have in Christ? Let us pray together. May all heads be bowed and eyes closed. Wherever you are this morning, whether you're in church or in the home that you are meeting, I want you to reflect upon this message from Hebrews chapter 2 today. Allow the Spirit of God to witness to your spirit right now. I want to ask the Holy Spirit to come right now and show you your need for this great Savior, Jesus. Firstly, I want to pray for those who do not know Jesus. You've never known Jesus. You never confess to Jesus that you are a sinner. You have never invited Him to be your personal Lord and Savior. Today, this is an opportunity. He has promised you to give you salvation, to free you from the damnation of sin and death, and to free you from the clutches of the devil, and to give you the abundant life that He promised to give you. And you say, Elder Silent, today I want to receive Jesus into my life. You can just place your right hand into your heart wherever you are. Wherever you are. I'm going to lead you in a, in, in a prayer. A prayer of confession, a prayer of invitation for Jesus to come into your life. Wherever you are, don't hesitate right now. Wherever you are, just place your right hand at your heart and repeat this prayer after me. Please do not, have any, do not have any fear because it's the Spirit of God. God is witnessing to you right now and allow the Spirit of God to speak into your hearts right now. Do not have this fear. You will have the peace of God when you pray this prayer. I can assure you that. Just repeat after me. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the message of the gospel today. I thank you that you have sent Jesus into this world to be my Savior, to die for my sin at the cross. I thank you too, Lord, that he is risen from the death and he is now seated at the right hand of God in glory. I confess my sin before you. Lord, forgive my sin. I claim the blood of Jesus into my life right now as a propitiation for my sin. I invite Lord Jesus to be my Savior, to be my Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, fill my life right now and bear that witness of what you are doing right now into my life. May you make yourself real into my life and lead me into life 
everlasting. For I pray and ask in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if you have prayed that prayer, friends, may I greet you with a huge congr congratulations. You are now a child of God. You are now being delivered from your sin. And you are Jesus, you can hear Jesus calling you my brother or my sister. And that is a privilege you are in. So go and talk to someone that has brought you to church today and share with them this exciting news of you receiving Jesus into your life. Do not just leave it away, just go and share with them and they will help you to get into church or into a, into a Bible study group, into the cell group so that you can be mentored, you can be helped in many ways to become uh, someone to be a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to pray this prayer for the church at large. I want to pray for my brothers and sisters uh, right across. Let us pray together as we commit our time to the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word this day. I pray that in the name of Jesus, your word will go forth Lord, that your, you will continue to minister and to touch the lives of each and every one of us, wherever we are. Grant that we become faithful witnesses for you, the proclamation of who you are, our great Saviour, and what a message of salvation that you have for each and every one of us. Help us to be faithful in what we are doing, faithful in our ministry, in our witnessing, and also, Lord, in whatever that we do that might give you glory and honour in our whatever area of influence that you have positioned us. I ask for your blessings upon my brothers and sisters and all the families that are represented here. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us from this day and until Jesus comes again. We pray and ask in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Before you go, uh, let me leave with you some questions for you to consider in your LNG groups. Firstly, knowing the truth of the gospel is important. Is my faith drifting away from God and His truth? And how can I prevent the gradual drift away from God and His truth? And that is the first question. The second question is that what impact does it have on your life, knowing that the Lord Jesus is not only your Savior, but he has also subjected everything under his power on your behalf. And the third question is, God used a variety of signs and wonders and miracles to verify the gospel. Am I experiencing God's miracles in my life? And how I, can I share these signs, wonders and miracles of my life with others around me? And so take away this question and have a fruitful time of reflection and consideration. God bless you all.
death was your sin Our resurrected King Has rendered you defeated Forever He is glorified Forever He is lifted high Forever He is risen He is alive, He is alive. The ground began to shake, the storm was rolled away. This perfect love cannot be overcome. Now, death, where is your sting? A resurrected king. Amen. Thank you, Elder Dr. Ong Silian, for the timely word this morning. We hope that everyone was blessed by the word this morning. And a quick reminder that if you are not subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, do remember to press on that subscribe button so that you'll get the latest updates on what's happening in our church, as well as our morning devotions, prayers, and so forth. So we just want to thank all of you for joining us today. May the Lord's presence go with us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you and have a fantastic week ahead.